Hello everyone, I'm your host PensyFan19 and welcome to the September 2022 PensyFan Periodical. This is a monthly news series which covers most of the major railroading headlines from around the world as well as my opinions on them. We have a lot of articles to go over today so with that in mind, let's get rolling. First off, the four year wait of Comic Con for railroads is over as Berlin just held InnoTrans 2022. This massive week-long trade fair hosted a wide variety of railcar manufacturers from around the world, showcasing the latest technology in railway communications, maintenance systems, and of course, railcars. If anything, there seems to be a strong emphasis on cleaner forms of energy, namely battery and hydrogen power due to not requiring costly infrastructure that comes with overhead electrification, with Siemens showcasing their first battery and hydrogen power multiple units, and Stadler presenting their hydrogen power flirt for Redlands Commuter Rail, among other multiple units, thus being the first piece of American rolling stock to appear at InnoTrans. With many railroads also announcing new procurements at InnoTrans, California was no exception as they announced the purchase of 29 more hydrogen-powered Stadler flirts, with the first four going to Ace Train for service between Sacramento and Merced, with the other 25 going to Amtrak California to likely supplement their existing stock which also might include their Siemens Ventures since for some reason I haven't seen any footage of them at all for a good two years. Where are they? Although, one thing that I really don't understand about these new MU routes in California is why can't they just be simple extensions of existing routes? I mean, the Redlands route is only 10 miles long and is at the end of two longer Metrolink lines, as well as Valley Link, who also announced state MUs, but could also be an extension of the existing BART line, essentially making this line another eBART. I mean, it's nice to see that all these pasture rail proposals are getting a lot of support in the state, but most of them are resulting in an inconvenient transfer in the middle of the region instead of a simple extension that allows for a one-seat ride. But commuter rail routing aside, I'm glad to see that InnoTrans is back and better than ever, and I hope that more American rail cars will make appearances in future shows, as well as possibly encouraging other rail affairs like this around the world. Speaking of which, here is some interesting news. S-Bahn has deployed their first autonomous commuter train while the Appenzell Railway is developing their first autonomous rack train. BNSF is to purchase a drone with rail wheels from Norway. Not really sure what the purpose of the wheels are, but looks cool nonetheless. A record number of dogs have traveled on the Eurotunnel in August. The Taco Bell Mexican Pizza Musical premiered on TikTok. A CSX Jeevo led a Northeast Regional without an Amtrak Genesis trailing. Metro led a massive private car special while the South Shore Line held a mini OCS with one Milwaukee Road business car. Vermont Rail System has slightly adjusted its livery with GP40FH number 313 for OCS service, thus being one of a few examples of recent passenger equipment being used for a freight railroad. Western Maryland Scenic has repainted their B32-8 and placed it into service. Tally Clinton is to be painted blue. The Aurora Express is to convert an abandoned Alaska Railway GP35 and six coaches into a continuous restaurant. The surf line is suspended for about 60 days due to erosion damage. And the Rockaway Beach branch is to officially be turned into a trail. Oh dear. This is absolutely devastating for NYC rail fans like myself. The trailification of this branch in particular especially stings since multiple sites were recently conducted by both the LRR and the NYC subway to restore rail service on this route within the last five years alone. But this trail doesn't even have the option for rails and trails. If anything, the loss of this rail line only further emphasizes the need to preserve rail right-of-ways for future use instead of turning them into bike lanes with plants, since it's much more efficient to connect two nearby communities with frequent public transit than an extended walkway especially when compared to cheaper options such as modifying nearby roads to be more pedestrian friendly. So that's why I'm urging you now more than ever to talk about the tragedy of rail trails with others and that we want rails over trails, or at the very least, rails with trails. Now here's a follow-up news section for articles covering stories from previous episodes. BNSF seems to be the testing ground for new road battery engines since they're now scheduled to test EMDs SD70Js while the same manufacturers to send their own completed battery shunters with a diesel option to Brazil. All while their rival, GE, or Wabtec, is to send more flex drives to KTZ in Kazakhstan. Speaking of road diesels, Union Pacific has released a modified variant of their new paint scheme, this time featuring a smaller shield on the nose. This modification is praised by many rail fans, myself included, since it's reminiscent of the previous UP livery from the 90s. 
Meanwhile, Omnitrax has purchased the San Luis Rio Grande Railroad from Iowa Pacific, while the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad could reopen as soon as 2024. Polaris CMUs have entered service on German name that I can't pronounce railway. And JR Kyushu has opened the first HSR line with nicely painted N700 train sets. In terms of stations, designs have been released for Barcelona Sense, as well as Windsor Locks, Connecticut. Why can't this station have two platforms, though? All the other stations on the line are double-tracked and have two platforms. Why can't this one have this sacred balance, too? In other news, CSX has released an Operation Lifesaver unit with one of their few SD-70 Macs on the roster. Nice to see that they chose a Mac instead of a Jeebo for this unit. Likewise, Ontario Northland has painted GP38 number 1808 into an Every Child Matters livery. URHS is to restore the sole remaining U34CH. The Livonia Avon and Lakeville has acquired the Ontario Midland. Sierra Northern has released a final design of their hydrogen powered switcher. Not too big of a fan of the paint scheme, honestly. Maybe it's because of the leaf at the end. Also, I'm not too big of a fan of the rendering of the CAF Type 10 LRVs for MBTA Screenline, primarily because the nose looks too elongated over the front wheels. Anyways, the Portland Streetcar A and B loops were the featured article on Wikipedia for September 22nd. Passenger service has been restored on the River Rhone. Mongolia has opened a new coal railway to Mongolian names that I can't pronounce. Queen Elizabeth has passed away as the longest serving queen in British history. Final renderings have been released for Talgo cars and cabs for DB along with boxy Merrimack MOW cars for Infrabel. Fenia Rail has ordered broad gauge Siemens Vectrons. TMH has released very long class name for St. Petersburg Metro. And Alstom has completed their first bi-level TGV M train set. And happy 25th anniversary to the Westchester Railroad and happy 125th anniversary to the Boston subway system, specifically the Green Line. After all that, it is now time for this month's Meme of the Month. This month's Meme of the Month is... CSX TikTok TTS. And now, the top story of the September 2022 Pansy Fan Periodical is... Strike averted! But delayed to October. Technically, this would be a follow-up story to July's periodical... But this topic became so much larger this month that it would only be right to cover it as this is the result of years of poor working conditions of railroad workers for profit-based operating practices of the freight railroads. Once again, there are plenty of different channels and articles that cover this with much more detail than I can, so I'll just try to give a brief overview of the situation at hand, again. As stated earlier this year, most talks about a strike initially came in July, where 99.5% of BLET union workers voted for a nationwide strike, along with several other unions, due to the shareholder-based practices of Precision Schedule Rarity, or PSR, which emphasizes longer trains and longer working hours with less infrastructure and fewer benefits. However, just before the proposed date of the strike, President Biden established an emergency board to negotiate with the unions, which gave them two 30-day cool-off periods, which pushed the strike date back to September 16th. Considering that most of the unions involved disagreed to the modified contract terms with a few days before the proposed strike days, several companies started to modify their schedules to adjust with the strike, with few people knowing its duration. Such cancellations included Norfolk Southern with most of their freight service, and surprisingly passenger railroads such as Amtrak and Metra, even though they would not have been directly affected by the strike, other than dispatch issues which supposedly led to their impromptu cancellations. Since much more measures were being taken to adjust to the incoming strike, major news media outlets from around the world started to cover the story, thus giving the rail industry a relatively rare spotlight in the mass media. But just one day before the intended strike, the Class 1s reached a tentative deal with the unions, who agreed to withhold their intended strike and restored all intended service while avoiding the national supply chain crisis, which also happened around the same time as CSX appointed a new CEO from Ford Motor Company. Although, most railroaders claim that the modified terms are just as poor as the initial contractual conditions, which resulted in some unions backing out from the modified agreements, which technically already started yet another 30-day cool-off period, thus setting a possible strike date to October 16th, which also happens to be around the same time as another proposed railroad strike in Britain. I must say, I absolutely appreciate the resiliency of the railroad unions who will not be satisfied by minor changes to existing contracts, and are instead calling for larger fundamental changes to the private freight railroading industry as a whole. Such benefits include two-person crews and increased off-time, 
since increased positivity in the work field would make the industry more attractive to new recruits, and therefore increase the workforce, enhance public image, and increase overall profit due to more business. Although, since most of the rail industry saw September 16 as THE date for a strike, some are wondering if the movement for a strike at a later date would still have as much steam from union workers and the media, but only time will tell. If anything, this year has proven that one of the primary ways to have good worker relations is to place the needs of the workers over the profit, and to meet a certain set of criteria in order to ensure good working conditions. Failure to do this will result in unsatisfied workers eventually taking out their frustrations against the company until their needs are eventually met. With that said, I fully support the strong efforts of these unions, who are trying to bring forth more beneficial working conditions to the rail industry in the face of profit-driven interests, and the support for these hard-working railroaders will continue to grow until their needs are properly fulfilled. Thank you everyone for watching this month's episode of the Pensy Fan Periodical. There have been a lot of rail news headlines for the month, and it will be very interesting to see what the future has in store for all these articles. Thank you again for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe for more. Have a good day.